Great. Hi, folks. Uh, Simon Mead, uh, again, a repeat introduction, urologist at the National Prion Clinic and Prion Unit in London. Um, thanks so much for, for that introduction, because I'm similarly optimistic, and I'm going to talk for 20 minutes on, you know, what I see is kind of, well, what what in particular focus on what we've been doing at the Prion Clinic um, in trying to develop a specific new treatment, what I think are some of the most promising commercial angles on treatment, that might impact the disease in the next few years. Um, I think perhaps at the start, though, I want to share Richard's enthusiasm and optimism that through our understanding, we, sh you know, we should be able to design treatments for this disease. It does seem, it does seem vulnerable to attack this disease. Now we have this level of understanding, and I'll try and explain why. And I think I want to also convey to you, you know, my personal commitment and dedication to trying to develop treatment is probably what I've maybe got 13, 14 years left of my career. And it's probably the most important thing I'd like to achieve in that time. I don't know, I could go on for long, who knows? <laughs> but um, first though, I, is this coming through clearly? It looks a little bird to me, but that could just be my vision. Um, First, though, I just wanted to point out that there are different types of treatment. And of course, we do treat patients with CJD now, of course, but this is management of symptoms. It's like for those of you that were at the dinner last night and have taken a paracetamol this morning. Um, you know, you're, you're basically covering up some of the nasty symptoms of the disease and some of the most nasty symptoms, psychiatric manifestations, this jerky muscle movements of my clonus that... Some patients get this awful muscle stiffness that can be painful and spasms. And then, of course, treating symptoms at the very end of life. Insomnia as well can be intractable for some forms of the disease. We do have ways to manage these. But, you know, it's not really what we want, is it? What we really want is, you know, a definitive way to treat the disease, to halt it, to stop it. Even maybe in the first instance, this will be slowing it down a little bit and buying a little bit more time. And as Richard correctly pointed out, and I totally agree with him, the idea in people that are, that are at high risk of the disease in families where, you know, maybe even the disease developing is inevitable at some time in life, preventing that from happening because you can catch it before it's even started. We know as a generality that is typically easier, isn't it, to take your statin to prevent the heart attack rather than, you know, stopping a heart attack as it's happening. Okay, so, you know, we are going to have to get molecular again a little bit, and forgive me for that, but, but you know, this is um, uh, what what treatments are going to have to be based on. And so, so first of all, I show you the normal prion protein that we all have. Okay, so it's there's billions of these molecules sitting on our nerve cells and, and other cells in our brain and, and, and to a lesser extent in other parts of the body. And it has a very specific shape. So, you know, Richard showed those chains of amino acids. And here I show how those we, we think are all folded up to make a kind of tight knot structure. You can look at it like beads on a necklace tied in a knot. Um, and, and this shape is very specific to prion protein, and it does some job, you know, but it, a bit for us, really, it's a bit like at the moment, even with the level of science we have, it's a bit like opening the bonnet of a modern car and looking and pointing at one small thing and saying, what is the job of that thing? And, the, you know, some of you may be kind of car mechanics and be able to answer the question very precisely, but we don't truly know what prion protein does, but it must have some function. It's been preserved by evolution, and it has a very specific shape. And it has these sugars attached as well. We don't really know why they're attached either. So there are lots of things we're ignorant about, but we do understand its structure quite precisely. And then as Richard highlighted, we've made massive progress in understanding the shape of the abnormal form. Now we don't have the shape of the abnormal human form yet, but what I'm showing you here, um, and this is our laboratory and the laboratory at Rocky Mountain in, in the US led by Byron Coey have both determine these structures independently. So, so this is the fold structure of the abnormal form. And yeah, so, so this is like a cross section of a fiber, okay? So what you've got to imagine here in this shape, I think you can perhaps see it, if it's not too blurred for you to see, there are kind of multiple rungs there. So the abnormal form is like a fiber, like a needle coming out of the screen. And each, each cross section of that fiber is folded in a very specific way. So perhaps one thing that's obvious that comes across from those two shapes is just how completely different they are. Um, 
So moving from specific structures and shapes to concepts now. So if you imagine that that normal form I showed you, first of all, is this kind of sphere. And then these purple squares represent that fiber form, the abnormal form or the prion form. Okay, so what happens in prion disease? What is this chain reaction that we can't stop? The normal form seems to bind to the end of that fiber. And maybe it just binds in a little place at first, but then slowly it unfolds and it unravels and it adopts exactly that sh same shape as the abnormal form. It's almost as if that abnormal form is stamped onto the normal form, meaning that that fiber grows a little bit. Now that might be fine if it was just one fiber that grows and eventually it's going to get stuck somewhere. But what seems to happen also is that fiber can break up and it can fragment, it can chop in two, and that, that creates more ends. Some of those will grow. So that end product of that growing makes more seeds that set off the process. And that, that is essentially what a chain reaction is. The product of the reaction is more material to start off the reaction. It's not entirely futile. We can clear this stuff. You inject the stuff into a mouse. We've made mice that don't have premium protein. You inject this stuff into a mouse brain that can't make it. It does clear it. The body can clear it. But I think like a, a bathtub with the plug out and the taps on full, you know, if you've got a good water pressure, it's, the, the bath's still going to overflow because it's all about how fast you can clear it. So let's talk about some, uh, Richard discussed a wide range of potential treatments. And here I want to kind of focus on those where there are, there's really concrete evidence and, and either been used in human or, or we think may be soon used in hum, human. So some of the most promising strategies from my point of view. So, so here I, I show you the same uh, reaction again, and I've added another little bit here because there isn't this, this other angle that I think when this is made, there's all kinds of different shapes thrown off this process. It's imprecise. And we think some of this material is particularly toxic to nerve cells, not necessarily all of it. There are, seem to be some kind of byproducts of this reaction that seem to be especially toxic to nerve cells. So that's I've added an, another little complexity to the the cartoon of what's going on. But I think one particularly promising strategy is just remove prion protein, okay? So we've made mice that don't have it. We've made cattle that don't have it. There is actually a Norwegian goat that doesn't have it um, that was found just by chance. These goats are perfectly healthy walking around in Norway and the mice and the cattle are healthy. So, you know, an obvious kind of chemical or therapeutic strategy is just get rid of the prion protein somehow. Now, of course, we can't engineer humans, but if we can find a drug that mimics that and gets rid of it, we will be completely resistant to the disease. And this is, this is one of the really active strategies. Okay, the next is find some drug that basically docks onto the end of these infectious caps or binds the, actually binds the healthy form itself and interferes with that process. So if you, if you stop that docking on, if you, if you make all of normal prion protein bound to a drug so that it can't interact with the prion, then you're not, you're not gonna grow prions either. And then the third strategy is, is somehow deal with this process of toxicity. Um, there are ideas behind this. I'm a little bit more of a skeptic about this. I suspect there are probably more, several different ways in which prion protein is toxic in the disease. And, I'm not completely convinced a, a drug that targets just one of them is going to make a big difference, but it's certainly a very active area of research. So for the next bit of the talk, because this has been a special focus of our clinic and our unit, uh, we've been uh, following, pursuing one of these strategies maybe for 20 years now, and that's uh, antibody treatment. Antibody treatments, you know, become particularly in the news now, because, you know, these new Alzheimer's disease treatments are based on antibodies that bind to the abnormal form. Actually, the antibody treatment that we've been pursuing in prion disease is a strategy whereby this antibody binds to the normal form of the prion protein. The idea is it docks it on and it prevents it from joining in this prion process. Um, so a similar, not precisely the same as the Alzheimer's disease treatments. So what are antibodies? Antibodies are, are large proteins that are made by the immune system 
in the body. The idea is you have billions, trillions of these different antibodies, and the idea is that they bind germs that are invading the body. They dock onto them and like wave a flag and tell the immune system to destroy whatever they're bound to. So we don't have antibodies against prion protein because that's one of our own proteins. You've probably all heard of autoimmune diseases, and that's often where an antibody in the body is attacking one of our own proteins. So our body is are designed not to make antibodies that attack ourselves, but we can we can specifically make an antibody by taking one of these mice that don't have prion protein and injecting prion protein into them, and they will they will generate antibodies. Uh, that was that was originally a mouse antibody. So in fact, this mouse antibody was called ICSM eighteen for Imperial College School of Medicine, where it was originally developed. And it, it binds extremely tightly to the normal form of the prion protein. And believe it or not, 20 years ago, it was shown that this mouse antibody was very, very effective against mouse prion disease um, for, the, for the reasons that we discussed. Um, we've actually then taken that mouse antibody and, and tweaked the amino acids in its protein structure to make it a human antibody such that it could be injected into people and it wouldn't be rejected. And that human antibody is called PRN100. So I just want to just describe a little bit about um, how we were confident that PRN100 and ICSM18 were effective treatments. So the way we do this is with these laboratory mouse experiments. So a few charts to show you. So I'll just show you, you know, describe how I've made up these charts. So, so this is like a, what we call a survival curve, okay? So on this axis, this represents the number of animals that are alive in the study. And on this axis, the days of the study, and this is going on for maybe two and a half years or so. And what happens is in, in this, our standard laboratory experiments, we inject prions into a mouse brain, and then we wait. And you inject these prions and mice seem to be able to cope with it immediately. There were no symptoms. They walk around as, as per normal. And then after around six months or so, all the mice in the group, all 10 mice, appear to develop symptoms and, and are cold um, as, as the disease is confirmed within a week or so. So this is what happens. The mice are perfectly healthy and then they all drop dead of prion infection. That's our model. It's a strong model of a disease in the laboratory. And it it means if we've got evidence we can change that, we feel reasonably confident that might translate into human beings relatively well. So a normal mouse, a normal mouse though, left to its own devices, kind of lives for about two years, just over two years. So that's even if they've had a little bit of salty fluid injected into their brain instead of the prion infection, they, they can go on for that long. So, so what happened with treatment? So these these are where groups of mice were treated with this ICSM-18 antibody. This was started about a month after they were infected, so it was relatively early on in their infection. And, and what you can see is just treating salt alone, not giving the drug. As expected, the animals died about 200 days, and then with increasing doses of the antibody, more and more mice survived, whereas at this most effective dose, that's two milligram dose, a proportion of the mice, about half the mice, lived to their normal life expectancy. And when those mice died, there were no prions in their body. So they, the antibody treatment appeared to have completely cleared prions um, from the mouse body. This was an antibody that doesn't bind prion protein, showing that just giving antibody treatments themselves don't have a strong effect on mice. So that was the mouse antibody. We had to make a human antibody. I mentioned that was called PRM100, and we had to check that it had exactly the same binding characteristics. It wasn't going to bind something else or cause some damage somewhere. So there's a whole set of experiments done to prove its safety and show that it binds prion protein in exactly the same way as the mouse antibody. We manufactured that, and then we, we sought funding to do a clinical trial. We were not successful. Uh, but we found a way to give this according to what's called a special needs license to six patients that we started in 2018 and we finished treating the last patient in 2019. We had to go to a judge to ask permission to give the treatment because this was not part of a clinical trial. Um, all patients that were treated did progress. Unfortunately, we didn't cure anyone with the treatment. Nobody improved. Um, Thankfully, we didn't see any major side effects. 
Um, actually, we ran out of drug during treatment of two of these patients who subsequently died. Um, so, you know, why am I still talking about this? Well, we saw some we saw some encouraging signals. Uh, you know, obviously, it's well, first thing is it's encouraging that we didn't cause any harm by it. We didn't cause any side effects. But I'm just going to sh show you examples of two patients. So, so this is given as an intravenous infusion, um, and this is this is over um, a year or so of treatment in this in this patient, um, and they had treatment every two weeks. Every time there's a red arrow there. And the green bar shows when there were we got low concentrations in the spinal fluid, and the green is where we hit this target concentration, with which we set at the start of, say, the target concentration was fifty. Now, you know, whilst this patient deteriorated, and you know, overall, as might be expected, when we hit the higher the higher concentrations in the spinal fluid, there was a suggestion that the progression wasn't quite as fast. And similarly, in this patient as well, they they, they seemed to kind of like. Um, deteriorate relatively slowly when the concentrations were reasonably high. These are only just hints that it might it might be working to some extent. The only way to prove this really is to have some kind of formal clinical trial in a comparison group, which is what we're hoping to do as a next step. There's another thing that encouraged us too, in that um, a couple of the patients that had treatment uh, after they died, they did donate their brains for us to look at under the microscope. And um, in this patient um, uh, that was treated with PRM100 for around six months, um, I'm showing you two pictures under the brain microscope there. And, and this is a patient that was not treated, a kind of comparison patient with a very similar type of disease. And we saw two things. Um, you know, Richard's shown you these brown deposits that reflect abnormal prion protein deposited in brain tissue. So basically, the brain appeared to be washed out of that material. So it appeared to be much lighter in staining for, for abnormal prion protein than you might expect. And we also so, saw heavy prion protein deposited around blood vessels, which we just don't see in normal people, or sorry, in, in, in um, patients with the similar condition that weren't treated. So it appeared that the treatment in some way was changing the brain pathology. Now, you know, most important, of course, is whether or not we can prove that, that those changes might be associated with benefits clinically, but it's encouraging at least that things were different um, and there was possibly some movement of abnormal pre and protein caused by the antibody. So in, in coming towards the end, I just want to uh, mention two commercial opportunities that are in development and how they work, so at least you've got an idea. So there's a company called Ionis that pioneer what's called antisense oligonucleotide treatments. So here I'm showing a blow up of this. This is a, an image I've taken from, from the internet. But here, here there's a blow up of a, a cell. This could be a nerve cell where the DNA code is. And that's made into RNA. That's a little message, like an instruction set to make an individual protein that's exported from the nucleus. And that then is used by the cell to make protein. So what this company, Ionis, have developed is a small nucleotide type drug that is complementary to the message for prion protein. So that is injected into the spinal fluid. It finds its way into nerve cells, and then it seeks out the message for prion protein. It binds to it, and then the cell either destroys or doesn't use that message to make prion protein. So this is a technology that's designed to stop prion protein being made. This has also been tried in mouse and, and appears to be rather effective um, at uh, slowing down the rates of progression of disease or the, um, the incubation period of disease in mouse. The second one I wanna, I, I wanna bring up that seems quite promising to me is called zinc finger technology. And um, this is this is being developed by a company called Sangamo. They also have prion as a stated commercial priority for their company. Um, this is quite complicated. And I've taken this from their company website. What they have is a protein um, called a zinc finger that docks very specifically onto different parts of DNA. And they've designed one that will bind onto the prion protein gene DNA. And their protein is also tagged to a different type of protein that tells uh, the body not to 
uh, transcribe this gene. So it basically gives a signal to suppress the expression of the gene from the DNA itself. Now you might say, okay, well, these are big proteins. How, you know, how do you take that as a drug? It's not taken as a tablet. It's more complicated than that. What they do is they package up the code for this machinery in a viral particle, and that's what's injected into the body. Um, in the mouse experiments, they injected this into the mouse bloodstream. And then that virus binds onto the lining of the brain, and it crosses that, gets into the brain, invades nerve cells, and then it expresses itself, and those proteins do their job. So it's quite a sophisticated machinery. Um, but this proved, to, in the mouse experiments, proved to be rather effective, and they're looking also to go into human beings as a commercial priority for their company. So I'll finish. I hope I haven't gone over too much. So, you know... Um, there, there, are, there are suggestions that we're entering uh, a new era for treatment of dementia. We have two newly approved treatments for Alzheimer's disease based on antibodies. And there's a lot of, there's a real buzz and a lot of excitement in dementia treatments in general. Um, I, I showed you a proof of principle for the antibody treatment we've developed and also mentioned another couple of treatments that have good proof of principle in mouse. This is a good model of the disease. This is really is prion disease in mouse. And therefore, you know, there's some optimism that when those are given to human, that you know they would they will they will translate well. Um, for the antibody that we've been developing, um, we can show that it gets into the brain, and there are no safety problems. Uh, there are hints that individual patients may be slowed, and our next step is a formal clinical trial. But we have no commercial support for this, and we're we're looking for unconventional ways to do it. But it, it is expensive. I mentioned ASOs and zinc fingers as two commercial things that are um, close to human treatments that are being uh, developed by companies. And um, I'd just like to finish also by thanking you all for your contribution to help us develop how to do these clinical trials by developing rating scales and biomarker measurements that will help us do clinical trials in the most efficient way. National Prime Clinic team, thank you. And um, and these are the people involved in the antibody treatment development of the prion unit. This is our, our unit in Fitzrovia. Thanks very much.